Good morning, everyone. Welcome to you. It's great to be with you on this fourth Sunday of Lent. And our focal passage today is that very famous passage from John chapter 3. The verse that we know so well speaks of how God loved so much that he gave his son for us. And so we will read the passage a little later, but our call to worship is based on that piece of scripture. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Let those who know they are redeemed celebrate it, those who have been reclaimed from deep trouble. Though we were as good as dead, God made us alive with the grace of Christ, through whom we are rescued and healed. O oh, give thanks to God for such unswerving love, for such wonderful deeds, for the children of earth. Amen. Let us pray.
as we have sung of your life on earth among us, Lord Jesus, we marvel at your love, we marvel at all that you have done for us. And we celebrate that you have made us your own. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we are so beloved of God that you would go to the extent that you did, that you would climb that hill, that you would carry that cross, that you would surrender your life for our sake. And thank you, Lord, that because of what you've done and because we are able to put our trust in you, you have opened to us the possibility of eternal life in your presence. And we can't get our minds around all that that means, but we are overwhelmed by this gift and grateful that we can be called sons and daughters of God. So we thank you this day, Lord. We praise you and we celebrate all that you have done for us. We pray that this morning that you would help us to know that joy again. Regardless of where we come from today, what our challenges are, what our sadnesses are, that somewhere deep within we would experience this joy that comes from you because you have made us yours, because you hold us in your hand, because no one can snatch us from your grasp. And so we have much to celebrate today. Because of your care, Lord, because you watch over us and because you are active and present in our world, we also bring to you the needs that we are aware of at the moment. We think of members of our own community who are grieving, who are fearful, who are struggling with material need. And we pray that you would be present and active through your church, that you would bring comfort and peace where there is uh, whether it feels as if people are in the midst of a storm. We pray for our nation as we continue to navigate our way through this pandemic, for government leaders, for frontline workers who increasingly are being vaccinated against this virus. We pray for the logistics around the delivery of, of the vaccine to our country. We pray for nations around the world as together we face this crisis and slowly begin to overwhelm it. We pray for wisdom. We pray for discernment and strength and courage. And we ask that you would come and be active and present in our midst. And so, Lord, we come this morning expressing our trust in the one who is here, who is not distant, the one who loves deeply, the one who is speaking and active amongst us all the time. We bring you these prayers, these songs, and our gifts of money, and we offer all these things to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. So this morning you may be watching this, this recording live at our 8 o'clock um, gathering, or you may be watching it a little later. But um, just to say that if you are watching at 8 o'clock, uh, be aware that there is another service taking place at nine o'clock this morning and th that will have the same scripture reading and the same sermon. Uh, the service will be slightly different and that will be taking place on the church property. So we're having an outdoor service today and we're very excited to be back on the property. And uh, if you're not able to, to actually be physically present, you are able to be a part of that service too as we stream that service live from nine o'clock at the same address, live.umc.org.za. And so that's going to be the pattern going forward for a time. At the same time, our children will be joining us and a Godly Play story will be um, told for them at 9 o'clock as well. They'll be part of the beginning of the service and then they'll, they, will, they will go off to the Godly Play um, part of the service. And so we're all together at 9 um, from today. As far as communion goes, we, we're going to... Uh, revert back to with the practice we were familiar with before and that is to have communion on the first Sunday of the month and so that will be um, at, at the beginning of April that our next communion service will take place. Uh, that will actually be over the Easter weekend um, but more details uh, closer to the time about Easter and how that's all going to work. Then just the other thing to share with you this morning uh, is some details which 
maybe news for some of you, for some of you it won't be, but uh, just to give you an idea of what's happening at the end of this year as far as uh, ministers at Mtlali go. Um, you, you may know that I was invited to serve in the Lower Tegela Circuit at Mtlali uh, beginning at the beginning of 2012, and that was a five-year invitation, which continued to the end of 2016, that was renewed for a further five years, and that um, full 10-year period now comes up at the end of this year. And uh, when, when Kim was invited to serve at Kersney, that was at the be beginning of last year, um, I still had a further two years of that term, which is now will be completed at the end of this year. And hard though it will be to, to leave this community, I think it's been quite clear for a time that it makes sense now that my family is um, in that part of the world and uh, that community to, to be open to an invitation to a church closer to where we're living. And so um, I, I made the decision to accept an invitation from another circuit and from the end of this year uh, we'll be um, working in the Westfall Methodist Church in the, the uh, Durban Metro circuit. Um, so that's what will be happening for me at the end of this year. Um, it's still nine months away, but just so that you're aware um, where, where I will be. And then we've been through a process with your leaders and with the circuit leadership and talking to the bishop as well as we've worked over the last year to find the right person to come to Mklali from the end of this year. And um, the uh, stewards have spoken with a number of potential people and we're very excited to say that um, uh, by the unanimous feeling of the stewards and talking with the circuit and with the bishop, we've extended an invitation to Reverend Mark Weemers to come and serve at Mklali uh, in the Lower Together Circuit from the end of this year. Uh, Mark has been in our, in our district, in our synod for I think about 10 years. Um, he's served previously, he's, at, he's in Richards Bay at the moment, he's served previously in Westville and then prior to that at Claremont in Cape Town for some time. And we would love to have Mark come and lead a service sometime soon. Um, so come and lead one of our out outdoor services so that those of you who can be there will have a chance to meet him and talk with him. And uh, already our stewards have been in touch with Mark as we start to, to look ahead to the end of the year and to make sure that everything is in place for his coming. So we're very excited about that. Um, I've had a chance to meet with Mark a couple of times and I'm very hopeful about how well um, he will fit in this context. I think it's going to be a, a really good move. And um, the only other thing to say is that this is all conditional on, on, on a, our conference, which meets in September, and they need to approve both my move and Mark's move. But everything seems to be on track, and the process has gone very well, and uh, we've had a real sense of being led by God in this. So um, that's just to bring you up to speed with what's happening end of the year. Um, and if you have questions, you're welcome to, to, to uh, get hold of me or to speak to the, to the society stewards or any of the leaders. Um, but that's just to, to keep you up to speed with, with what's happening um, by the end of this year. Then we turn to our gospel reading. This morning, and Pam is reading for us today. She's reading from John chapter 3, verse 14 to 21. The reading this morning is from John chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for fear their sins will be exposed. 
But those who do what is right come into the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. May the Lord add our understanding to this reading. Amen. So the passage that Pam has read for us this morning uh, introduces us to some of the most familiar words in all of the Bible, doesn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not die but have eternal life. This verse is so famous that sometimes if you're watching on TV at sporting events, sometimes you'll see people holding up signs that just say John 3.16 because it's a given that we know uh, what, the, what the verse is. Uh, that's how well known the passage is. But this morning, as we've read that, that uh, larger passage, I want to concentrate on something that comes just before that famous verse. At the beginning of the passage that Pam read, John alludes to a strange story from the Old Testament. He writes this, he says, As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the desert, in the same way the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So John is suggesting to us that there is something about the way that we believe in Jesus that is similar to something that happened in the days of Moses, the story with a bronze snake. So what, what's going on there? What is the bronze snake all about? Well, we read in the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 21, verse 4 to 9, that there was a time when the Israelites were in the desert. They'd escaped from Egypt, and uh, they were being fed by the manna that fell overnight every night. Remember the manna from heaven? They'd escaped, and they were on the way to the Promised Land, but they were not happy. In fact, whenever we read about the, the Israelites in, in the desert, they're, they're not particularly happy. So they'd gotten tired of, of eating manna, they were thirsty, and they began to complain. They complained uh, against God and against Moses. And so we are told in this passage from Numbers that God sent poisonous snakes among them, and some of the people were bitten and died. Now that's a disturbing little story that we could we could have a conversation about that did god send snakes to bite the people of israel or were there snakes there and the israelites who were conscious that they'd been badly behaved assumed that god had sent the snakes uh, we could have a long discussion about those snakes but whatever the case it seems that the effect of the snakes coming into their midst helped them to reform their behavior and they repented and came to moses and said that they were sorry about what they had said, and they asked for help. And so what did Moses do? Round up some snake catchers? Or did he manufacture a vaccine at high speed to deal with the, um, the poison? No. We read that Moses prayed for the people. That was the action that he took. And God replies to Moses, saying, Moses, make a bronze snake, put it on a pole, and anyone who has been bitten and who looks at the bronze snake will be healed. So it's an odd story, isn't it? And you may be troubled by some of the questions that the passage raises, but can I invite you this morning not to be too, dis too distracted by the, by the snakes and that story? Because the snake story is not the main thing that we're focusing on today. The main thing today has to do with Jesus. So the Apostle John takes that story of the snake and he uses it to illustrate something about Jesus. He says to us that just as those who trusted in the bronze snake were saved, so we who trust in Jesus as he is lifted up on a cross will be saved. We have something in common with those Israelites. We too will not die, but, says John, we will have eternal life as we trust in Jesus. And it's the question of trusting in Jesus that is central for us to think about today. Now, last Sunday, I think I told you that Kim and I had attended the first block of our spiritual direction training. Uh, it's a course that we're doing mostly online. And uh, one of the articles that we were asked to read for this, this training last weekend was written by an English Jesuit by the name of Rob Marsh. And the, the article was titled, Teaching Spiritual Direction as if God were real. 
provocative title, isn't it? Marsh, Marsh describes how he'd been in ministry for a number of years. He'd been serving in all kinds of capacities, doing all kinds of Christian work. And he always would have said that he believed that God is real. That was never an intellectual problem for him. And um, when he says real, what he means by real is not whether God exists or not, but he's saying that God is present and interested and involved and available for real interaction. So all through his ministry, Rob Marsh said, I believe that. I believe that all those things about God. But he came to a point in his life where he realized that the truth for him actually was that God's reality was more notional than actual. He believed all those things about God kind of in theory, but not in reality. God wasn't real for him in that sense. Because it is very possible for us to get on just fine, for you and I to get on, get on just fine in the Christian life, saying the right things and even believing the right things about God, but not living as if God is active and present and involved in the details of everyday ordinary life. And I know that this is possible because as I read through Marsh's article, I thought to myself, that's me. I've been there. Much of the time, although I believe all the right stuff about God, um, intellectually I have no problem with those things, but much of the time I'm living as if everything is up to me. And I'm not anticipating that God is likely to intervene or to get involved directly in what I'm doing. Often I'm living as if God is not real. And I wonder if maybe some of you can relate to that sense of believing the right things, but, but not actually living as if God is active and present and, in, and ready to engage in everything that we're doing in all of life. And so this morning, we're going to hear an invitation to live as if God is present and active and available for interaction uh, with you and with me every single day. And then we'll see how that colors the, the gospel reading that, that, that Pam read for us today. So, if we are to encounter the God who is present and active in our world, the first thing that we're going to need to do is to leave space for God. Leave space. You may remember, many of you, that in 2019, pre-COVID, we hosted uh, what is called a week of guided prayer at Mklali. And numbers of us, those who signed up, met for half an hour a day for five days over that week with somebody who was our designated prayer guide for that week. And that person, that prayer guide, helped direct our praying during that week. Now, uh, during that week, I was being guided. Somebody was my prayer guide. But recently, I had the experience of being a prayer guide, sitting on the other side of the room. And I found it unbelievably challenging. Because my natural inclination was to go and sit with the person that I was guiding in my first meeting, to listen to what they had to say, and then to think up ideas or dig up resources and say, what could I give them that would be helpful for them in their praying? And kind of plan out the five days and say, here's what we're going to try, and if that doesn't work, this is what I'm going to suggest, and, and hand out the resources that I'd found. Because that was a process that I would be able to control and direct from start to finish. But that would leave no space for God. I would have crowded God out of the encounter altogether. And that defeats the whole point of the exercise. Because a prayer guide's job is not to lecture someone, but to listen and to help the person to meet with God for themselves, and then to get out of the way if need be. To leave space for God to do what God wants to do in the life of that person. St. Ignatius said that we are to allow the Creator to deal with the creature. That's the heart of the, of the role of a director or a prayer guide. So, instead of being able to control the process, I found myself going into these sessions with fear and trembling, not knowing what was going to happen, and not having filled the entire space, but having to leave room for God to lead. And if you're a person 
relax to be in control and relax to plan very carefully, maybe you can sense how unsettling that is. That sense of not actually knowing what's coming. What was wonderful though, um, in, in my experience of that week, was that we were led by God uh, in, 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 in remarkable ways by leaving space for God to do what God wanted to do. But that only took place because, because the risk was taken and space was left. Trevor Hudson reminds us that this whole world, this whole universe, the cosmos, is God-bathed, permeated with God's living and active presence. God lives in this universe, he says, like we live in our bodies. The universe is full of God. Uh, in him we live and move and have our being, says Paul. You remember that from the book of Acts. And if we are open to this truth, says Trevor Hudson, we begin to get a sense of the God who is present and active in every experience, in every encounter, in every event of our lives. So, in your life and mine, with all its frantic busyness, are we leaving space? For God, the God who is active and present. Now the second thing is related. We said first we leave space for God. If we have left space for God in the busyness of our world, the second thing to do is to listen or to notice, to pay attention to what happens, to what God does with that space. I have a very clear memory as a young person of being uh, in a meeting once, a church meeting, and we were struggling with some difficult decision. There wasn't a clear answer to, to the problem that we were grappling with. And so the person chairing the meeting, instead of just allowing the discussion to continue and the arguments and the, and the debating to carry on, um, the, the chairperson just said, let's stop. And he brought the, the debate to a close and he said, I'd like you to sit quietly and pray and listen. And let's see what we hear God saying to us. You know, it sounded to me like he was, he was uh, it al almost as if he believed that God was present and active and speaking in the middle of our meeting. How would you feel about that? If that was the way that we, we operated within the church or in other aspects of our lives. Imagine in a family discussion, not sure how to handle a decision if we just said, well, let's stop and leave space, and listen, and pay attention to what God is saying. One of my lecturers in Stellenbosch, uh, in the coursework that I did down there, has written a book called Meeting with God's Voice. And uh, this is Frederick, Frederick Murray, Dr. Frederick Murray, who's written this. And he suggests that this way of operating, like that, the chairman of that meeting, should be the norm in our meetings. And he maps out uh, a very practical framework for church meetings where space is created and time is given to listen and discern and we're given the opportunity to notice what God is doing. Now this takes some getting used to. It can be quite uncomfortable actually. If you're like me and you find the silence um, uncomfortable and you really want to rush on to the next thing so that we have something tangible to show for the time that we've spent in our meeting, um, it, it can be hard just to sit and be still. Also, typically we're not really waiting for words, audible words from heaven. Uh, we're not just waiting to hear words, I mean, although that, that is possible. But we're listening for more, and it's quite a subtle listening process. We're paying attention to our full experience in that place. We're listening to our anxieties and asking what they may be saying to us. We're questioning our feelings. What's going on? We're, we're looking at the kind of questions that are in our minds, asking ourselves, what is happening here? What is God doing and saying in our midst? And so I ask that question again, in your life and mine, in all of its noisiness, are we paying attention? Are we listening to God? Because God is active and present and speaking. 
I'm sure that at some stage in your life, you have been on a leadership training course or a team building retreat uh, or something like that, where the facilitators of the, of the experience divided you into groups and then told one of you to climb up onto a table or some kind of raised surface um, so that you were up above the, the, the others standing behind you. And that person had to turn away and turn their back to the people behind them. And then the rest of the group had to line up in pairs and join hands, join their arms, so that uh, they could catch you when you fell backwards off, off, the, off the raised surface. That's called a trust fall. I'm sure many of you have seen it or experienced it. It's quite an experience, putting yourself literally in other people's hands like that. And sometimes it goes badly. I've seen a few, a few examples where it hasn't worked out so well. But mostly, it's quite a, a helpful thing to do as you learn to trust deeply that others will catch you as you fall. And this is where the rubber hits the road. When you're watching somebody else do a trust fall, if you're standing on the side and you see somebody falling and being caught and you see it being done repeatedly, uh, it's, it's not even, you don't even feel nervous on their behalf. You say, of course it's going to be fine. Of course they will be caught. There's nothing to worry about here. But when it's you standing up there and you're about to fall backwards, very few people don't look back over their shoulder to make sure that everything is in place. Uh, we find it quite difficult to, to let go and to fall like that. And that is the difference between believing that God is active and present and living as if it is true. It's one thing to, to go along with a theory, this all seems fine. It's another to step out and act as if it is true. You know the story, I've told it to you before, of the famous tightrope walker who wheeled a wheelbarrow across the a tightrope over Niagara Falls. And he said to the crowd who were watching him, uh, do you believe that I could put a person in the wheelbarrow and take them across? And the people said, yes, we believe that you can. And so he said, who will volunteer? And nobody would go. They believed in theory that he could do it. They had no problem accepting that. They, they believed it in their minds. But in terms of actually being prepared to trust him with their own lives, that was a different story. And eventually a little old lady climbs into the wheelbarrow and he takes her across and back. And it turns out that she is his mother. That's the difference between believing that God is active and present and living as if it is true. Now, back to our story from, from John's Gospel and the, and the numbers reading that it was based on. In the desert, when the Israelites were dying from snake poison, the stakes were high and they came. They trusted that bronze snake. They looked at it. They lived as if it were true and they were saved. They, they, they put their trust in that uh, bronze snake, and they were saved. Uh, they, um, they, they lived as if it were true. In the Gospel reading, John says to us, the stakes are high. This is an important message that he shares with us. It's at the heart of the Scriptures. He says to us, you are dearly loved by God, so much so that Christ is given up for you. God loves the world so much that he gave his only son. And you and I are offered life, says John, as we look to the one who is on the cross, who is lifted up on the cross. But this is not just an intellectual exercise where we mentally assent to some doctrine or some historical event. We're not just ticking a box and saying, yes, I go along with that. We're invited to entrust our lives to the Lord of life, to live as if it is true. That's the, the link between these two stories. This is an invitation to trust, to live as if it's true, to live um, in the same way that Rob Marsh describes, as if God really is real and active and present, and Jesus really is offering us in this moment to take hold of his hand and to trust in him. So I hope that this morning you can hear just how much you and I are loved. God loves this world so much that he gives his only son for us. And I hope that you can hear that this love of God expressed in Jesus on the cross is active and present in the world and in, the, in our midst. God is reaching out all the time 
to you and me in this God-bathed universe. Now we can just mentally accept that truth. We can say, yeah, I'm fine with that, and, and move on. Or we can go much further and live in its reality by leaving space for God, by listening, noticing, reflecting, and then by letting go, as in that trust fall. By trusting and believing in the one who was given for us. There is the invitation for you and me today to take hold of the hand of this God who is actively reaching out to us. How will we respond? Amen. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord God, for your great love for us. These words are so familiar to us that we can easily move past them. But that the Son of God, the one who existed before creation and through whom all things were made, would enter our world and offer up his life for us is mind-blowing. Help us, Lord, to stay with this and to hear it deeply and not just to agree and move on. Thank you, Lord, for the truth that you are reaching out to us all the time. And we pray that today you would help us to leave space for you, to listen deeply to what is happening and to notice and to reflect on, on the daily events of life and then to be prepared to let go and to put our trust in the one who is actively reaching out to us so that we may receive this gift, this incredible gift that you offer us, life eternal in your presence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind. To me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the nine and I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you. your fault, still your love fought for me, you have been so, so good to me, when I felt no worse, you paid it all for me, you have been so, so Shadow you are.
won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down May God bless you in this week ahead as you make space and listen and trust the one who is actively reaching out to you and longing to express love to you. We close with this benediction. Just as God's word was sent into the world to heal and redeem, so God sends you into the world this day to be light and love, healing and hope. Go now to be the light for the world. And may the grace and peace of God the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer come upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Grace and peace.